morning, church. It is wonderful to see you all this morning, and welcome to those that may be watching online at home as well. How lovely is it that the sun is out? <laughs> what a beautiful day it is. Um, but for now, we're going to pass on to um, our worship team as we sing our praises to God. We thank you, Lord, for your love to us. We thank you that you have brought us here to come and sing your praises together. We praise you, Lord, for your grace to us. We don't deserve anything, but you have shown us your love. You have forgiven us your sins when you died on the cross for us. We have so much to be thankful for, Lord. And we pray that you will inhabit our praises now. And we pray that you will help us to learn from you as we listen to the sermon. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to show love to each other as we meet together before you. In Jesus' name, amen. And our first song is Only by Grace.
Well, when I was uh, thinking about the, the passage that um, we'll be looking at today, um, I was wondering what song might go with it. Um, it's about the vine and the branches. Jesus says, I'm the vine and you are the branches. And then he says that he prunes the branches so that the, the, the plant will become more fruitful. Um, and that's a sort of refining process. Um, and so I thought of refiner's fire. So let's sing, sing refiner's fire, purify my heart. take your seats now and um, it's the time for our offering um, the money we give to the Lord those of us who worship here on a regular basis Father God, we thank you so much for these precious and wonderful and generous gifts that we give every Sunday and other ways that we can serve you throughout the week too. And we just pray that these, these gifts will be multiplied in your name, Lord, that so we can go and do even more work in Selsden, in Croydon and further afield to be able to spread your name, Lord. Amen. 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 Hello, everyone, am I on? 
Okay, lovely. Um, I'm going to invite Tamsin to come and help me if that's all right. <laughs> you may have heard the tune just now that we were playing during the offering. You may have recognised the tune, but our uh, Minister Trevor has written some new words to that tune, especially for next week. And um, yes, it's the coronation next week. And I don't know if you need those. And, uh, and Trevor's written the uh, words to a tune that you'll know, which was I Cannot Tell, or you may know it's another a song. And um, we are going to just run through it this week. So we're all ready and prepared to do it for next week. So children, um, some of you might think, oh, there's an awful lot of words here. I'm not sure if I can read all these, but I quite like to listen. If you would like to come and do a little activity while that's going on, I'm going to put some things down the front. So King Charles, who's going to be King Charles next week, is going to have a really busy week. Maybe you could just come and colour something for him and think as you're thinking about that as we sing and try and learn this song and then you can learn a little bit of it. So while we're singing, if you want to come down and colour in something for Charles, then there we go. Now, Tamsin, over to you. Jesus our King, as history is made today, and a new ruler sits upon a throne. We pray our King would know you as a Father, a saving friend who makes with him a home. We pray for strength.
Okay, so in just a minute, we are going to watch a video. And in this video, it's talking about some really important things. It's talking about safeguarding, how we can keep everyone safe when, we're, when they're here in the building, and what we can do to make sure that they are safe at all times. So what we're going to do is watch this video, and then afterwards, Dawn and Sally are going to come and speak about it afterwards. We care about everyone who is part of our church. We know that every one of us is precious to God and that each person deserves kindness and respect. This mirrors what the Bible says. As we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. Galatians chapter 6 verse 10. Safeguarding is about making our church a safer place for everyone. You all know that we're already doing lots of great things here in our church that help with this. We have several people in the church with special responsibility for safeguarding. Our designated person for safeguarding acts as the contact point for anyone with any questions or concerns. Our church trustees or deacons all have responsibility for safeguarding and making sure we have policies and procedures in place. One of them takes a particular interest and acts as our safeguarding trustee. Our church safeguarding policy and procedures tell us how we look after everyone involved in church services, activities and events. We review this every year to make sure it is up to date. This includes having a safer recruitment process whereby we take up references for anyone who works with children, young people and adults at risk. We also carry out criminal record checks, known as DBS checks, on those who work with our children, young people and adults at risk groups. Regular safeguarding training keeps our church workers up to date. All those working with children, young people and adults at risk are responsible for following our policies and procedures. If you are ever concerned for yourself or anyone else in the life of a church, speak to the designated person for safeguarding for advice and support. They will follow our policy if they need to involve others inside or outside the church to help keep you or someone else safe. Please don't keep a worry or concern to yourself. So we're trying our best to make our church a safer place for everyone. What can you do to help? Treat everyone, whatever their age or situation, with kindness and respect. Make sure you've read our safeguarding policy and procedures. Follow the guidelines for how our groups and meetings are run. If you see something that worries you, Pass it on to our designated person for safeguarding. Thank you for helping to make our church a safer place. Across our Baptist Union, thousands of churches are committed to creating safer spaces for everyone. I'm just reiterating and probably reinforcing and um, enabling you to be
be aware of some of the things going on already in the church. From the video, you would realize that safeguarding of children, young people, and adults are at risk uh, is one of the most crucial aspects of our governance um, of Selden Baptist Church. Uh, as a result, you would find, I encourage you to read the policy, which you can find on our website. And already some of you are involved in getting the um, safeguarding policies through. But in short, we are all responsible for it. And it's just for you to recognize something of a concern, whether you're sure or not sure, once you've recognized it, respond by acknowledging there is something not right, or maybe right, but you're not sure. Report it, or record it, and then report it. And that's one of the reasons we are here to introduce the team of um, our safeguarding. So um, I also would encourage you, if you notice the um, May edition of the Insight, there is something new also that has come through as for recording and streamlining events. And these are policies, guidance and advice that we need to go through. So you might be seeing some changes um, alongside that would be coming up. And what can we say? The tech team have been trying, but um, there are still always room for improvement. And for some of you running the groups, you're doing a very good um, job in terms of um, adhering to some of the policies. So please feel welcome and read, especially the latest one in the um, May Insight magazine. I think I'll also seize the opportunity to introduce ourselves. There's one missing at the moment, and that's Trevor, the minister, who is part of the team. Hilary Howard is the one who makes sure we are on ball with auditing and making sure we adhere to all the standards and expectations um, in terms of the legal requirements from the Baptist Union that manages that. So, um, Hilary Howard, if you give a wave if we don't know you. <laughs> then we have the one who makes sure that every worker in the church is up to scratch with the training. So she organizes the training, making sure all administration aspects of um, what we should know is on board. Very organized, and that's um, Theresa Nichol. Thank you, Theresa. Did a great job. And if you haven't done the um, level two or level three, or this is where I think we are all expected to get it done. So please get on board. It's great fun. The little little things we might ignore but it goes a long way as for us to be caring for one another and being safe ourselves. Then we have Don Cox, who is the deputy designated person. She, in fact, does all the administrative work. And um, she also is very hot on the DBS, um, which she will be talking about later on. I am the one who does the creme a la creme. Um, aspect of things. Um, if there are any concerns, it comes to me. And what happens is if there is a need for advice or support, that's where I get on board to assist where necessary. And sometimes there's the need to refer on based on also the policies. So there's a huge transparency monitoring and auditing system that goes alongside. And it's all about keeping us safe. I think finally, I would also want to say a big thank you for those who are already running groups, people like the youth groups. There are things like event activities that needs to be well-structured and safe in terms of many aspects. And um, that is a job to do. Same also, so I think you, um, Katie, is one that we actually especially because of kids, have to keep an eye on, and she's doing a great job on that. Then you also have Hilary West, who is just taking another challenge. Um, she also has a lot to monitor and make sure things are done and safe in place. Legalities is just another complication when it comes to that. And I would say also the tech team, um, there is one thing about recording, live streaming, and um, events. 
I say read again, it's about the press. Um, and they're doing wonderful in terms of trying to safeguard and keep. So thanks to all of you, especially those running groups as well. There are other aspects about um, health and safety, which is all linked. I want to say thank you. But for you who may not feel you are doing, or you're doing nothing, if you notice something, just it's all our own, our job to do that. So on that note, I think I will pass on to um, Don, who will be talking a bit on the DDS. Thank you, Don. I'm a lot shorter. Um, Okay, so very briefly, you, they said a bit about the DBS checks on the video you've seen, but it's a vital part of our church's safeguarding approach. And it's a way of checking someone's criminal record, and it helps us to decide whether the person is suitable to work with our children, young people, or adults at risk. And it actually also serves to protect you as you volunteer serving our church. DBS stands for Disclosure and Barring Service, and it's a government agency that carries out our DBS checks. They used to be carried out by the Criminal Records Bureau, which was the old CRB. Um, many of our church workers have had their DBS checks, but if you have agreed recently to become a volunteer, whatever your role, you may need a DBS. However small you think your volunteer role is, you might be very surprised to know that you will need a DBS check. So if you have any thoughts, concerns about this, please have a chat with me or Teresa. We do the DBS bit together um, and we can you know, help you work out whether you need one or not. If, um, if you are volunteering already, I will be on your case um, because I have people I still need to, to check up with whether they have one. Um, so, yeah, please talk to me or Teresa if you have any thoughts about this. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I'll just say something, actually. I've just got an extra thing. Just got an extra... Is that on still or not? I've um, just got something extra to say. It's come in the film, and Sally said it. It is about reading the policy. Um, you might know we've only got six deacons, and if you notice, two of us are on this team. So that would be really helpful if you could read the policy and read it right through. Um, it does take a little bit of time, but you can also see how much work um, the groups and the team has been doing. So if you can read the policy, that would be great. Thank you so much. Um, but for now, we'll invite our children and young people to go up to their groups and we pray every blessing on them as they learn more about our one true God. Thank you. Morning, Selsden. How are we? Oh, we're awake. That's good. Um, can I just say a huge thank you to the safeguarding team? It's not the most interesting subject in church life. It is undoubtedly the most difficult group to be on, um, and the team do phenomenally hard work dealing with difficult situations, complex situations, um, and they are just so professional. We are so blessed to have such a fantastic team. So, safeguarding team, thank you very much for all you do all of which is completely quiet and confidential as it has to be, um, but thank you for that. Um, a few quick announcements. Amy, are you going to come and talk to us about Zambia? Good morning. Um, so I just wanted, I really did promise Trevor that I would keep it brief. Um, so. Obviously, last September, I went to Zambia working with a charity called Footprints. And as I have explained a couple of times, they work with children who are living and working on the streets uh, to get them into safer situations, whether that means 
getting them back reunited with their families or getting them into a safe house or a boarding school or a children's home, just depending on their ages, their gender, and what they need personally. Uh, I'm going back to Zambia this year with them again um, with the same charity. Uh, it's via Mission Direct, so really there's two charities, so Footprints and Mission Direct are both involved. And um, yes, so that's going to be really great. Um, and also at the same time, uh, I spoke briefly a few months ago about the fact that when I was, when I got back from Zambia, I wanted to get more involved with the medical side of things in terms of stoma care in Africa because uh, obviously I have a stoma, I had to have the whole of my large intestine removed, I'll have a stoma forever. And as much as that is brilliant for me in this country where we can have our healthcare supplies for free, um, very thankfully, um, in, I wanted to know what it was like in places where it isn't possible to not only get your supplies for free, but you also a lot of the time are going without very basic necessities. Um, so I found an organization which is based in Zambia, in the capital city, Lusaka, in the same place that Footprints is based, and they have the aim of giving out um, stoma supplies to people who need them, uh, which is very difficult because it's even quite difficult to get stoma supplies out there in the first place, and stoma supplies are very expensive, like most medical supplies. So. I started collecting stoma supplies here to send over there. So I've bugged every hospital in London that has a stoma care uh, department. Uh, I've found the email addresses for all of them. The ones I couldn't find the email addresses for, I sent them a physical letter. Uh, and then, because I have quite a lot of friends outside of London, I was like, brilliant, I could bug loads more hospitals by recruiting all of my friends to help me, which has actually worked out quite well. So, yeah, so far I've, you know, I've, I don't drive either, so when I'm going to collect these things, I'm taking, like, my empty suitcase to, like, St George's and list a hospital which is in Stevenage, and I'm going to Paul Hospital next week. So they're always like, oh, yeah, do you have a car? It's just like... Yep, someone will definitely be picking me up. Uh, and really, I've just got like my gym bag and my uh, big suitcase. So um, yeah, I have been busy collecting a lot of supplies. I also had my story about everything printed in a magazine that focuses on like ostomies and everything like that. So people have been reaching out to me through that. And then it will soon be printed in another magazine as well, so hopefully I'll get even more donations through that. And a lot of the hospitals have been like, please take our stuff, we've got too much and we can't do anything with it. So that's great, so hopefully I'll be able to keep this going for a long time. Uh, and I think at the moment, currently, I have about 5,000 stoma bags in my bedroom that are between a massive suitcase that underneath of my bed and in a drawer. So. Yeah, <laughs> thankfully, and I share a room with my younger sister as well, so I'm sure she's really happy about it too. Um, but anyway, so I'm raising funds for my trip. I'll be spending one week working with StomaCare Zambia, uh, doing visiting patients who are having complications with their stoma and helping with that. We're also planning on running a workshop for uh, patients, carers, and healthcare professionals in stoma care and the best practice and things like that. Uh, and then I'll be spending two weeks with the Footprints team, going out on the streets, doing outreach with the kids and helping to get them into safer situations. So because of that, I'm doing a cake sale after church today. I bribed two of my sisters to help me make cakes. So I would really appreciate any donations. Uh, the cakes aren't priced just as, as little or as much as you want to give. I'm more than happy. Thank you all so much.
Wow, amazing. Thank you, Amy. A um, couple of other little things. Um, it's the coronation next weekend, obviously. We're having a breakfast here on the Sunday morning. Um, so if you're interested, there's a sign-up sheet outside. If you can sign up for that, it's starting at 9.30, not 10 o'clock, as was mentioned uh, in a few other places. So 9.30 next Sunday, do go and sign up if you're interested. Um, and then one other thing, we've got a plant sale on Saturday the 20th of May, starting at 10.30 till 12.30 p.m. Um, if you're interested in that, do come along. It'll be very good. Thank you very much. Um, and now Dawn's going to come and do our reading for us. Morning. The reading today is from John 15, verses 1 to 17. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends, for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. Thanks, Dawn. Um, we're really pleased this morning that um, we've got Mant Banthorpe coming to... Uh, to preach for us this morning. Trevor's away on holiday for a week. Um, so Matt, why don't you come on up and uh, we can pray for you. So Matt's from Chrome, where, Chrome Road. Um, trying to work out the microphone. All set? I think so. Fantastic. Good. Let me just pray for you before you start. Father, just pray that you open our hearts this morning to hear what you have to say to us through Matt this morning. And I pray you bless him as he brings your word to us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you very much. Amen. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. That was a resoundingly good good morning. I take it you all can hear me okay? Yes. Fantastic. Um, so I'm going to begin, strangely enough, talking about sport. Um, Trevor and I are in the same cluster, so we've gotten to know each other, and we've bonded, unfortunately, over our mutual love of West Ham United Football Club. <laughs> the less I say about West Ham, the better today. But I've very much been into sport my whole life. Um, throughout my schooling, I played every sport that I could. And I kind of had to, because all of the schools that I went to were awful at sport, 
It wasn't my fault, but they were quite bad at sport. I played football wherever I could, rugby wherever I could. In primary school, I even played netball quite regularly because that's the only one that they played regularly. I have loved sport all my life. And uh, as I went through secondary school, I started playing rugby league. And I know what you're all thinking. I don't look like a rugby player. This is a thought that my mother shared as well. She was always very worried when I went off to play rugby. I'm not the biggest guy in the world. I never have been. And when I was in the under-14s playing rugby league against teams like Croydon Hurricanes and uh, Brixton Bulls, all of the players, and I mean all of the players that I played against, were at least three to four inches taller than me. Some of them had beards. This was under-14s, remember? <laughs> My mother's worst fears did come true uh, one day when, I, when she had to get a phone call to come and pick me and my dad up from Brentwood Hospital because I'd broken my hip playing rugby. Yeah, that wasn't even the worst injury that happened that game, but I won't go into that. But when I was playing rugby, something that would always happen is before the team went out onto the pitch, our coach would give us a team talk. He would talk to us about what our game plan was, what he wanted from us, the things that we needed to focus on, the areas that we needed to work on. He would motivate us, he would encourage us to go out there and do our best. Here in John 15, we have something quite similar happening. Jesus, in this farewell discourse that we find in John, is encouraging, is teaching, motivating his disciples before he is taken from them. This part of John 15 is, as I said, the farewell discourse. It takes place just before Jesus is betrayed, just before he will go to die. And here is Jesus' final chance to instruct his disciples, his chance to prepare them for when he's not around, before his disciples go off into the world. And here we have the last of seven metaphorical I am sayings that are found throughout chapters 6 to 15. When Jesus says, I am the true vine, this I am mirrors what God said in Exodus 3, 14. When Moses was there with the burning bush and talked to God, when he asked God, who should I say has sent me? God says, I am who I am. Jesus' I am sayings mirror this, showing his authority. And he's preparing his people for what is about to come next. And as a good Baptist, I have three points for us this morning. The first is abide in Christ. The second is abide in love. And the last is allow yourself to be pruned. So let's look at this first one, abide in Christ. As Jesus uses this metaphor of, I am the true vine and you are the branches, there's a connectivity there in this metaphor. We are intrinsically linked to Christ in our relationship with him. To abide in Christ means to continue daily in a personal relationship with Jesus, characterized by trust, by prayer, obedience, and joy. We're called to walk by faith, to trust in the gospel in our lives. When things don't go well, who do we look to? Who do we trust? Are we able to trust God when things seem murky? And when things go well, who do we give glory to? Who do we thank for what's going on? If we're to abide in Christ and walk by faith, then the glory goes to Jesus and our trust goes to him as well. When we abide in Christ, we must spend focused time with him. Does God fit into the spare moments we have in our life? Or is our life instead something that we fit around God? Is God at the center of our priorities or as other things? Life is busy. There is so much that we have to do. Work, schooling, kids, bills, taking care of the house, doing laundry. I got away with that one because I was expecting my wife to look at me when I said doing laundry, but she didn't. It's fine. There are so many things that we have to do in life. There are so many things that can take up our attention. 
we run the risk of God being this thing that we just put to one side that we'll deal with on Sundays, and the rest of the time, we do what we want. Instead, our time needs to be focused on him. The time in our week has to be intentional in our relationship with God. And when we do that, we'll engage in intentional actions in our lives. When we focus our time, we'll do these things. We'll read scripture. We'll pray. We'll live in the community. We'll fight sin. To abide in Christ is to have a relationship with him. Are we praying to God? Are we reading his word? We sit at a point in history where we have more access to the Bible than ever before. Back in Jesus' day, towns, villages that were teaching on the scriptures may have had a scroll that was completed, one of the prophets maybe. And what would be common practice for disciples to do is memorize them. If we went among the disciples today, one of the things that they would ask when they see our Bibles is, how much, do you, how much have you memorized? You have so much of this. They had so little. How much do we know by heart? Don't worry, I'm not going to test you this morning. But how well do we know our Bibles? When we're asked questions by friends or families about faith, about God, about morality, are we able to give them answers? Part of abiding in Christ is knowing him, knowing his mind, knowing what he wants for us. Abiding in Christ should affect every part of our life, our work, our relationships, how we raise children, how we treat one another, and how we involve Christ in our decision-making process. When we abide in Christ and we abide in Christ effectively, people should know that we are Christians by the way that we walk and by the way that we talk. Because when we abide in Christ, we aim to be more like him in everything that we do, to the point that when we meet someone for the first time who is not a Christian, they should probably think, there's something a bit strange about you by the way that we love other people, by the way that we treat other people, by the goodness that pours out of us because we abide in Christ. What kind of relationship do we have? Is our relationship with Christ an afterthought, or is it the most important thing to us. In this passage, Jesus commands us to love one another as I have loved you. And this brings me on to my second point. Abide in love. Love must be a distinguishing part, distinguishing mark of a disciple. We're called to love one another. By that, I mean the people around you the people sat on your left and right, to love each other, even when we don't get on. The way that my wife and I put this when we have disagreements, it happens, we're married, usually it's my fault. I haven't put the washing out, I haven't unloaded the dishwasher, something like that. I've touched one of her plants and they've, they've died mysteriously. It happens. I don't know what happened. But when Shannon, my wife, who's at the back there, have disagreements, we might be falling out a little bit. The way that we put it is like this. I love you dearly, but right now we're not friends. It's the idea that our relationship is solid. It's on a firm foundation of love. But right now, I would rather talk to anyone else but you. But I love you, and we're going to keep moving forward. We're going to keep working together. It doesn't happen that often. Well, probably happens more often than it should. I'm sorry, Shannon. But it's something that we work through. There's this love even when we don't get on. We need to show the same sort of love for each other. When we're in church meetings that are an hour longer than they should have ended, and we're disagreeing about the same point, about what color the chairs are gonna be, about what color we need to paint a hall, or maybe some bigger issues, some more important issues. And we're disagreeing with people in our church, in our fellowship, when we're not getting on over someone's behavior. Even then, we must love one another. 
even then we must be united in the fact that we love one another and we love Christ. That's the only way we will move forward as the church. That's the only way that we will move forward in our corporate relationship as the church. What we can't do is what the church in Corinth did. Paul writes to them, condemning them for the fact that they've gotten to the point where they filed lawsuits against each other. Now, I admit, sometimes I haven't gotten along with people in church when someone's taken the last bit of quiche at a church lunch. You know? But I've never gotten to the point where I feel like I need to file a lawsuit with someone. And I hope and pray that you haven't either. But the early part of the new, well, the early church that we find in the New Testament is a guidebook on what not to do in a lot of places. Don't fall out with each other to the point that you file lawsuits. Instead, love one another. Love one another even when you don't get on. Love this church that you are a part of. Love means supporting one another. It means encouraging one another. And it also means disciplining one another. Holding each other to account. It's a key part of love. I have a two-year-old who seems to be going two, going on 30. He's a very independent lad. And the truth is, I don't really like disciplining him. But I have to. That's my job as a parent. When he goes to shove a fork in a plug, I have to tell him off. When he tries to jump off of a sofa that is far too tall, I have to discipline him. Even if I was the one who originally jumped off the sofa. Discipline is a massive part of loving one another. And as the church, we need to hold each other accountable. This microphone is going everywhere at the moment. As the church, we have to hold each other to account. We have to first and foremost not be quick to judge. We have to, you know, assume the best of each other. But when things go wrong, we have to hold each other to account. We have to make sure that we're not doing things that are sinful, that we're not, you know, tarnishing our reputation amongst the wider world. We have to discipline one another. And Jesus gives us a method for doing so in the New Testament. There is a real importance on love. So we do have to abide in love, love for one another, love for Christ. But in this passage, Jesus goes one step further. Because he says, love as I have loved you. He'll go on to say shortly after, greater, no greater love is there than this than one who lays down his life for his friends. Love to that extent. Love to that passion. But how has Jesus loved us? Paul says in Romans verse 5, for it is while we were still God's enemies, we were reconciled to him. So God, Jesus, didn't just love us when we weren't getting on. He loved us when we were his enemies. Are we able to show that kind of love? That kind of love, not only to each other, but the world around us, the world that is at odds with us. Are we able to love our enemies, the people that really don't want what's good for us, the people that hate us, the people that we really don't get on with? Are we able to love like that, like Jesus had loved? It's a hard challenge, but one that we have to do as Christians. The last point I want to make is allow yourself to be pruned. Now, as I mentioned, when I touch plants, they die. I am not much of a gardener at all. I'm lucky that my wife is, otherwise the garden would look awful. The only thing I'm allowed to do is mow the lawn, and that is under supervision. <laughs> so when Jesus says, prepare yourself to be pruned, I had to look it up. It's a gardening term. It describes cutting off the unhealthy, the unnecessary kind of parts of a plant to make sure it's more flowery. I don't know if that's the right word, but it is. It is today. So when Jesus says that we will be pruned, pruning describes the painful but necessary removal of negative things in our lives 
so that what can remain will bear more fruit. One of the things that as people we don't like doing is admitting to our own faults. We don't. But we have them. We're human. Sin has infected the world and, you know, we are sinful. There are traits that we have that probably aren't helpful. Which is why we need to be pruned. We need to be made more into the likeness of Christ. By this point in the passage in John 15, pruning has already taken place within the disciples. In chapter 13, Jesus kind of cleansed them spiritually by washing their feet. Washing away their sins. And in the second half of it, they were cleansed literally. Judas was removed from the group. Someone who was toxic to them. Christ will want to remove that in our lives which is not beneficial. Even the things at the moment we may love. Christ will look to remove toxic people. Vices that we have, temptations, addictions, personality traits, pride and sinful behaviors. All things that at the moment we may not feel are bad. But in fact, they're getting in the way of our relationship with Christ. They're getting in the way of us being the people that we have been made to be. Part of discipline that comes from love is recognizing those things in our lives, in ourselves and in others that aren't beneficial. And getting rid of them. Going through that pruning process. Pruning is, unfortunately, necessary. It's necessary for us to be the people that God has made us to be. And it's something that we'll probably work our whole lives on doing. We should always strive to be better, to be perfect, to be Christ-like, but also accept the fact that we never will in this life meet that standard. Because Christ was perfect. Christ was sinless. So prepare ourselves to be pruned. And we have to prepare ourselves. We have to allow ourselves because pruning isn't going to be comfortable. It's not going to be nice. Those toxic parts about us, the toxic people that we may surround ourselves with, we tend to like them. We won't want to get rid of them. It will make us uncomfortable. But what's the point of all of this? What's the point of Jesus saying, I am the vine, abide in love, abide in me? Be prepared to be pruned. What is the point? Why is he saying all these things to his disciples? It all comes down to bearing fruit. Christ wants us to be fruitful and to produce fruit that lasts. When we allow ourselves to be pruned, when we abide in love, when we abide in Christ, then we will be the most fruitful that we can be, spreading love and joy and the gospel into the world. Only then can we be the salt and light. Only then can we make a positive impact on the world. So what we need to ask ourselves is do a little bit of reflection. What's my relationship with Jesus like? Am I quick to love and slow to anger? And does my love show to the people around me? And do am and, and am I in need of pruning today? They're not easy questions to ask, and the answers we may not like. And the correction may be difficult, but it is necessary. It's necessary because Christ loves us and we love him. Because we want to be like him. Because we want to make the world a better place for Christ. So, let us allow ourselves to be pruned. Abide in love for Christ and one another. And above all, abide in the risen Lord Jesus. Let us pray. Glorious God, Heavenly Father, we bow before your throne of grace this morning. And we thank you that even when we were your enemies, you died for us. Even when we were running away from you, when we denied the gospel, that we denied your son, you died for us still. We thank you that even though we are sinful, you died for us. We thank you, Lord, for the greatest sacrifice that could ever be given, for the greatest event in human history. And we thank you, Lord, that through Jesus' death and resurrection, 
we are reconciled with you. We pray, Lord, that we treat our relationship with you seriously. That we may reflect upon our relationship. Want it to be the best that it can be. Help us, Lord, to love one another, even when we're not friends. Help us, Lord, to reflect on that about that about us, which is not helpful. That is holding us back from being more fruitful. That's holding us back from living our life in all its fullness. Help us, Lord. Send your spirit this morning. Anoint us afresh. Help us, Lord, to conform to the likeness of your Son in all that we do. And we lift this prayer in the name of the risen Lord Jesus. Amen. The next song that we're going to sing, and the last song, is All I Once Held Dear. Let's stand and worship together. All I once held dear, built my life upon all this world reveals and wars to own. All I once thought gain, I have counted loss, spent and worthless now compared to this. No. And thank you, Matt, for, for bringing the word to us this morning. Thank you for that. Um, we have tea and coffee this morning afterwards, as normal. Um, do come and join us. It'll be great to have a chat with you afterwards. Tea and coffee served through there. Um, but as we finish, I'm just going to pray for a blessing upon us all. Pray, Lord, as we leave from here this morning, that we will know the limitless love of you, that it loves us no matter who we are, what we've done, where we are, or where we go. Pray, Lord, throughout this week that we will abide in you. And pray, Lord, that if your tender pruning comes upon us this week, we'll be open to receive that, knowing how much you love us. Be with us all as we go from here. Amen.